Entity Selection and Company Formation, prepared for and presented at the 2014 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. First of all, I'd like to thank Mary Louise for uh, inviting the Postinelli firm and, and me specifically to be here today. Uh, it's a, uh, always a pleasure to, to come out and, and talk with uh, startup uh, businesses and individuals starting businesses. I spend uh, about half my time uh, at Postinelli uh, working with startup ventures from, from basic organization to more complex financings. Uh, and I represent both company or what we call issuers, you know, ent entities that are going to actually be issuing securities, as well as venture capital funds, angel investors who are eventually going to make investments in your entities. Uh, I've been with Postinelli for uh, just over two years. Uh, I've been practicing for uh, seven years. Uh, but, but we have a, a very, very diverse group of attorneys uh, at Postinelli over a wide range of, of expertise, uh, specifically in our St. Louis office, uh, that deal with startup issues. Everything from employment um, to, to complex security issues to real estate issues, about everything that could come up in the context of a startup company we likely have uh, expertise. Uh, and that is my marketing plug. I think you guys have the, uh, um, these handouts with you, so I'm not gonna go through the first couple of slides, uh, but if anybody from our firm's marketing department says, did he talk about this stuff today? You can <laughs> clearly say yes. Um, so we'll move on to, to my presentation. And, and, and generally, uh, you know, one of the things Mary Louise told me when I, before I agreed to do this uh, was time frame, uh, everything along those lines. Um, I've been told I have 30 minutes to talk and 15 minutes for you guys to ask questions of me. And I, I'm going to, at the risk of upsetting my host, I'm going to say I'm not going to abide by that. If you guys have questions while I'm giving my presentation, please stop me and ask. Uh, oftentimes it's better for me to figure out exactly what areas you need to know about uh, than for me to ramble on and then run the risk of people forgetting their questions. So, so please stop me, raise your hand, wave your hand, jump up and down, get my attention somehow, uh, and I will try to answer any questions that anybody has. So. As Phyllis alluded to uh, in her, her last three bullet points uh, that we're not talking about today, the most important question that all startup companies have is, is whatever I'm going to do going to help me raise money in the future? Startup companies are notorious, as all companies are, for needing a lot of cash, needing a lot of investment. So if you have that basis, that question at the forefront of your mind, it's going to, to, to really guide you in terms of which way you need to go, what decisions you need to make. Uh, everything from the attorneys you select, the accountants you select, what type of entity to you select, how do you go about issuing equity interest in whatever entity you select. All those are going to be centered around this question. Is it going to help me raise money or is it going to hinder me? If the answer is it's going to hinder me, it's time to start looking in a different direction because you're going to run into trouble relatively quickly. So not only in the presentation today, ask yourself that question, but as you're progressing through whatever stage your company is right now, whatever stage it is a year from now, if you ask that question constantly, uh, you will be in a position where you're at least thinking about what's going on in the future. Um, here, here are a list of, of some relatively common funding sources uh, that, that we have experience with dealing with uh, as far as startups. Obviously, some of the names that Phyllis mentioned appear on this list, Biogenerator, Missouri Technology Corporation. Uh, there are very active angel groups in the St. Louis market, St. Louis Archangels, the Billiken Angels, uh, as well as some uh, quote unquote venture capital firms. Cultivation Capital probably is in that VC fund area, uh, but 
they're not the traditional VC that you think of that has multi-million dollars to throw at, at a wide array of investments. They, they do very targeted work. Um, and, and fortunately, we're involved in a lot of that work. Uh, so it, it's a good connection to, to have, if you're a startup company, entities that have access to capital like cultivation does among others, of course. So, so this is a list of funding sources. Uh, jot it down, take a mental picture of it, and remember it for the future. Before you get to the point where you can make a determination about selecting a business entity, uh, you, you have to understand that that decision isn't gonna come as a result of any presentation that I give or anybody gives today. Uh, it's not going to come based on a Google search that you do uh, with, with a bunch of blog post responses that say, hey, here, here's what I set up, here's what went well. The, the best way for startup companies to get off on the ground floor and started well is to have a very, very close relationship with their counsel. Once again, because everybody remembers the lesson that I tried to impart two or three minutes ago, well, he's asking me to do something. I better ask, how is this gonna do, how is this gonna affect my ability to raise money? And that's an important question to ask when you're looking for an attorney. Attorneys, accountants, other professionals that you work are going to be integral part of your team. Uh, they're gonna be just as important as members of the board of directors not as important as the actual technical know-how that brings to the table, but they can raise issues. And if you get attorneys that will invest in your company, then you're gonna build a relationship that will potentially facilitate future relationships in the future, as in my example, we've got relationships with both the the company side, the issuer side, and the financer side. If you can meld those two relationships, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic situation to be in as for a startup company. Talk to other people. You know, we have a room full of entrepreneurs. There is a building full of entrepreneurs. And as Phyllis said, there are lots of buildings full of entrepreneurs in the St. Louis area. All of those individuals have specific expertise about their attorney, about their accountant. Talk to those people. Figure out what they do, what they like, what they don't like about their particular counsel, and, and use that as part of the basis to make a decision. Talk about attorneys investing in their clients. Uh, obviously, everybody knows, or I hope everybody knows, uh, you know, attorneys don't put out tangible products for the most part. Yeah, we put together documents, we send them out the door, but, but really our expertise is the intellectual capital we bring to the table, how, to, how we get stuff done, what our thought process is. That's a paid service, obviously, so expect to pay your attorneys something. Also, you should have an expectation that your attorneys will invest their time and not be compensated for it. One of the things I do for all of our startup companies is I will attend the first year, two years of board meetings at no charge, uh, at, at, a, at an hourly rate that is generally you know, $250, $300 an hour, uh, I'm willing to donate that time so that I can be a further part of the success of the startup entity. Get the board meetings off on the right foot, make sure everything's heading in the right direction. If you have, so, some attorneys, will flat out not take that flexible of an approach. Uh, they will look at the hours that they spend and, and they will send you on a monthly basis bills for that time. There's nothing wrong with that situation. Uh, but, but as startup companies, you have to make a decision about the allocation of resources. So you have to make a determination of whether that time you're spending uh, with, with the attorney who is going to bill you for every single 10 minute phone call is worthwhile or not. If you can't answer that question that we started a presentation with, maybe it's time to consider a different avenue. In addition to you know, knowing what our expectations are, you guys should also have a little bit of insight about how the internal workings of a law firm 
are. We are evaluated based upon, in part, the amount of origination we get. Origination is kind of a funny word for, for a, a first touch concept. If a client calls me up and says, Andrew, I'd like you to do X, Y, and Z for me, great, I'll open a file. I am now the originating attorney for that file. I have a vested interest in making sure that that client succeeds so I can continue to <clears throat> develop it as a business and part of my portfolio of business as an attorney. If you find yourself in a situation where you are not necessarily in contact or direct contact with the attorney who's the originating attorney on your file, there's a possibility that the attention to detail, the, the investment that attorney may make in you in terms of free services, donations of time may not be as beneficial as if you're dealing with that originating attorney. Postinelli, we have a very flexible process in terms of how we divvy that origination out. So there's a vested interest over a wide array of attorneys, which is very important, uh, at least in my experience. Um, so figure out what the investment of the attorney is going to be in your situation and, and make sure everything you're doing uh, brings that attorney in, in line with the expectations that you have as a company. Billing, billing, billing. All right, so, so that's, my, that's my disclosure about dealing with your attorneys. Obviously, you're gonna need attorneys to assist with the, uh, the organization aspects of your company. There are lots of nuances that will come up regardless of the entity that, this, that you end up selecting. Um, and those are, those are discussions that, that your attorney will be able to assist you through. L let's, let's move on to some, so a, a few practical points, then we'll actually get to the, the entity selection questions, um, which, which some of you have likely already wrestled with to the extent you have existing entities, and, and some of you may be wrestling with in the very new, near future if you have yet to form your corporations or limited liability companies. Board of directors and board of managers. This is your first opportunity to get outside thoughts, outside influences affecting your company. So, so what do we look for when, when we look for a good board of directors? We want individuals who will provide credibility to this company. If we've got a startup in the tech industry, we want to make sure that, that we have representatives of businesses in that industry uh, or, or technical leaders that are on our board. We need that for expertise. Investors who are looking at it, or looking at our company, are going to want to see that type of expertise. Once again, you're going to need the potential for industry or, or funding context. If there's a board member who has relationships with angel investors or VC funds out the wazoo, that is a very valuable board member to have because the opportunity to network with that director's connections be, could be potentially very lucrative um, in terms of getting funds through the door, which we know is our central goal. Andrew, Andrew? Yes, <coughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, the first touch your lawyer has your background, mm -hmm. but my company is IT, so I'm going to want somebody who knows something about patents and IT and all of that. Right. How does that work? And then what are you looking for in terms of board of directors? Which one of those people would you invite to attend your board of directors meetings? Generally, uh, that's a good question. I'll take the second one first. Generally... Uh, the, the individual who, who is most willing to donate time to go to those board meetings is the originating attorney. Um, if the originating attorney is a patent attorney, then he is likely to defer that to somebody who has a more corporate or governance background. Um, so, so, so that turns into a situation where maybe I need to ensure that 
this firm that I'm going to be a part of will not solely invest based upon who's getting the origination, but will take a broader view in the continuing success of, of this company uh, from the get-go. Um, so, so that's that's kind of you know, I, I would I would be, get involved with a firm that would be very willing to meet whatever the needs the company has. If it's a particular IP patent related issue, that then obviously you want somebody associated with that with that expertise to be on the hook for it. Um, if it's a standard corporate governance type situation and just board meeting where, where no IP issues will come up or they'll be minimal, um, then, then that's the way I, I would go. And, and the most important in the beginning? I, given that, that most uh, of the assets um, of a company in the startup stage are going to be intellectual property assets, and, and the question will be whether, whether they're patentable or not, um, I, 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 I'm in the corporate group, I have a bias toward the corporate side of things because I would much rather see companies start right by their governance, by their organization to make sure they're on the right foot. Now at the same time, if the sole asset that you have is a potentially patentable idea, concept, Obviously, there's a, there's a push and pull. You, you've got to do everything you can to protect that asset. So, so, so really, I think the answer to your question is you go with whatever expertise you're needed. Right now, there, there's, no, there's no set answer. And, and ideally, you go to a firm um, that can satisfy both of those needs. Maybe not with the same attorney, but with a team of attorneys. Yes? It, it, once again, it, it depends on, on who your potential targets are for investors. Uh, there are some entities uh, that, or some investor entities, that want some diversity on the board of directors before they invest. Um, there's, no, there's no set answer, so you have to identify who your, who your targets are. If you have a you know, friends and family who are going to provide your initial startup financing. It likely doesn't make sense to bring in Warren Buffett to be on your board to impress grandma and grandpa, uh, or, or your great aunt and uncle, or, or your son or daughter. Um, but if your target is prologue or, or somebody else, they're, they're going to want to see some type of, of industry expertise. And so it really depends on who you think your target investors will be. And that, to, to plug uh, CET, CIC, and the ecosystem, that is a, a topic that mentors uh, who have experienced this process before can, can address with you a little more in detail uh, based on their experiences. But that's my standard answer, uh, is it depends. Is there another question? Um, so can you speak to um, the number of uh, board of directors, members that you would see on a, on a startup team, and then the compensation for those individuals? Sure. You know, some of them will be your investors if you have private investors. So I'm talking about the yeah. Typically, at the startup stage, I don't like to see a board of directors exceed three or four people. Uh, there's nothing magical about that number. I have seen plenty that have a board of directors of one or a board of managers of one. That doesn't work very well uh, because then you have absolutely no diversity of opinion. Uh, too many more than that, you run into complication issues. And one of the slides you'll see later on, complication at the early startup stage isn't good. It's expensive, it confuses investors. The simpler you can have your structure at the beginning, the better. Uh, so, so much more than, than three or four, or many more than three or four members of, of the board, I think gets a little unmanageable. Obviously, as, as your investor base grows, they may insist on different makes up, makeups of board of directors, um, but that is so, always something an issue, it is always something that you can change at a later date. Compensation, Compensation is, is tricky. 
we would all love to pay directors adequately for their time, but it is often a cash crunch early on. So, so, so what we see a lot of the early compensation be for directors and managers it is based upon uh, options to acquire equity interest in the future. A and there is no set formula for what directors um, can get on the equity front. Uh, most of the time, I see equity grants in the range of 1% to 3% for directors. Um, but once again, it, it's, it's industry specific and, and it's company specific. Um, and 3% is likely on the high side, um, but, but I have seen it that high. And it all depends on what that particular director is bringing to the table. Uh, any other questions about board of directors, makeup, anything along those lines? Time is not a startup company's friend. Your competitors are moving, costs continue to grow, and if you can't move quickly, then you're going to run into problems. And, and also, investors who are going to come in expect to have some type of exit event. So, so when, you're, when you're structuring the, the structure of the entity, the equity nature uh, of the entity, you have got to think about speed through all this. Um, if you don't think about speed, you're going to get yourself in complicated situations, and complicated is bad, especially when you're trying to get outside money in. So what I've found is simpler is almost always better. If you've got two alternatives, one you can implement within a week or so, you can tell a quick story to your investor, and the other one has an outside chance of reaping greater benefits, but it creates a situation where you can't really sit down uh, in a one hour meeting with an investor and explain what's going on. Um, the, the preference is always going to be to take the simpler. Um, if, you, if you try to go complicated early, what you're, end up, what you're likely going to end up doing is getting more complicated down the road. Yeah, as you'll see as your company progresses, things get complicated enough quickly, or quickly enough if you start with a simple premise. So, so don't unnecessarily complicate your situation at the beginning when you can move on to other things. The other issue that, that often comes up with startup companies is people who take the simpler is better concept to a different extreme and just don't document anything. Investors are going to want to do some level of due diligence on you. They're, they're going to want to see that you have confidentiality and invention rights agreements between the company and its directors and its founders. They want to make sure that the company has access to all of the assets they, they determine they need to successfully operate the business. If you ignore all that, if you don't document the option grants uh, from the company to those initial founders or to the initial members of the board of directors, an investor is going to see that, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb, and you're going to have problems down the road convincing that investor that this entity is together enough for me to make an investment. So, a lot of your early resources generally needs to be spent on making the company as pristine as it can be for subsequent investors. Now, when we say as pristine as it can be, we're not going for you know, spit shine shoes. We need to be able to tell a coherent story, have the documents to support that, uh, and also not spend a fortune getting to that point. So it's a fine balance. So, all this introductory material, this was the real title of the presentation, how do we select a form of entity? Generally, startup companies choose one of three entities, either C corporations, S corporations, or limited liability companies. 
you probably have a basic background of corporations and LLCs, but I'm going to go ahead and go into a little bit of that area uh, just to, to make sure we're all on the same page. C corporations are the standard corporations that we all think about, IBM, GE. They are limited liability entities in that they are entities separate and distinct from their stockholders. Uh, and there are two layers of taxation for C corporations. The corporation pays tax at its level, and then when the corporation's earnings are subsequently distributed to investors, those investors are subject to tax on those dividends. So limited liability, good. Double taxation, bad. Enter the S corporation. Still has the same attributes of a corporation in terms of limited liability, but we have eliminated the double, cor double taxation potential because S corporation income flow through to the individual shareholders. So if, if a corporation and that's an S corp has one shareholder, it earns $100. It's the, the corporation pays no tax at the corporate level, but the shareholder pays tax on that $100 of earnings at his personal level, his or her personal level. Better system, but there are some limitations on S corps that we'll talk about in the future. And, and finally, limited liability companies. Once again, limited liability, just the way corporations are. Partnership taxation, which is the flow-through taxation, uh, essentially, that, that we talked about with S-Corps. So it's got the best of both worlds. One layer of tax, limited liability. There are a variety of benefits, pluses and, and minuses, for C-corporations, S-corporations, and, and limited liability companies. Um, C-corporations, uh, with my examples, GE, IBM, everybody knows those. Investors know those. They know how to invest. They know how to deal with ownership of C corporations. Uh, you can have multiple classes of ownership, all with potentially varying rights. And that makes them a particularly attractive avenue for venture capital funds and other more sophisticated uh, investors. Uh, you have the ability to exit C corporations um, either through IPOs, through, through tax-free exchanges, and, and there are certain tax advantages associated with C corps that don't necessarily exist for S corps or limited liability companies. Obviously, the, uh, the two detriments that C corps have identified or that are on the list is what we've already talked about, the double taxation and any losses the corporation experiences don't automatically flow through to the shareholders. S corporations, once again, benefits, a lot of the similar benefits of the C corp, um, but the limitations are a little more extensive. Uh, you're limited to the number of shareholders you can have. Uh, the owners all have to be United States residents. The big one is the third bullet point under the minuses. Only one class of stock is allowed for S corporations. One class of stock basically means you can't have a single class of stock with different preferences in terms of distributions, uh, a preferred return, anything along those lines. The only thing you can have is voting and non-voting. So essentially, every share of an S corporation has to have the identical rights of every other share. That doesn't work well in the, the VC world or the investor world um, because, one, as you'll see, one of the things that, that VCs always want is some type of preferred return. Limited liability companies are good with the exception um, that the operating agreement, which is the basic organizational document that sets forth the limited liability company, is an extremely complicated document to negotiate. It's very expensive, and for the most part, um, the, the benefits 
that are, are exist for LLCs are eliminated when you get a VC fund and want to make, wants to make an investment in your company because they're going to insist on converting to some type of C corp, or because they don't want to deal with um, with pass through losses. Um, Mary Louise is giving me the time is up signal. Uh, I have a few more slides. Most of it is, uh, should be relatively self-explanatory. Uh, obviously, I will stick around for the remainder of the program, program during any breaks and at the end. If there are any questions, any more specific questions that people have, uh, please feel free to see me. Okay, take a few now. Okay. Yes. A I am not familiar with that nomenclature. Is it a low profit corporation? Those are, quite frankly, those are relatively new entities. Uh, that I don't have a lot of experience with. Um, so before I say something that I will have to backtrack on, uh, I, I think I better leave it at, at that. So. Yes? Um, you had a slide where you indicated that um, you guys were, worked with VCs. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about how you, would, how you work with those VCs and how that could benefit um, a startup? Sure. One of the things we do, it's basically a um, introduction based. You know, we have a set group of funds that we deal with. We've got connections, managers, principals at those funds. Um, if if we have a client uh, that that we think fits nicely within the portfolio companies of that fund. Uh, I have no qualms about calling up those managers or principals and saying, hey, take a look at, at this entity. Now, obviously, due to conflicts issues, our firm doesn't represent both sides of the same deal. Uh, it, would be a, it would be an awkward situation, to say the least, much less uh, in land me down in Jeff City explaining to the Supreme Court of Missouri why I... Uh, thought I could represent both sides of a transaction. Uh, so ethical issues notwithstanding, but it's really more of an introduction based. Uh, we, we obviously we don't take an active role in soliciting funds from anybody, but uh, you know, we, we can serve as a, a network liaison more than anything else. Are there any other questions? All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry I ran out of time. <laughs>